Greetings, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to welcome you all to this lecture hosted by Moses Kotane. What we would like to do first is to appreciate your time and the effort that you've put in making sure that you avail yourself for this event. We all understand the importance of really upskilling ourselves. This is especially true when it comes to the fourth industrial revolution. The fourth industrial revolution focuses more on continuous learning. What does continuous learning mean? It means that as human beings, we need to constantly upgrade our skills and upgrade ourselves. It doesn't mean that the information that you learn at university is still relevant at this day and age. So that is why it is important that continuously you learn new information and you actually assist yourself in understanding the current affairs and what is, under, what is happening in the world currently. Also, what I would like to take note of is the impact of uh, COVID-19 on various businesses in South Africa, not only in South Africa, but also worldwide. We've seen that a number of businesses have had to shut down during the lockdown period because um, basically they were not able to operate. Hence, that has had a negative impact on their business operations. Thus, it is important that during this time we utilize it to upskill ourselves so that we actually are ready when the time comes when we can operate again. And it will be as business as usual as the time progresses. So before I continue any further, we all understand that in South Africa we have a problem of illiteracy. What does illiteracy mean? It means that half of our population still cannot read nor write. So if our population cannot read or write, what does that mean? It means that we have a responsibility as people who have knowledge to actually assist those people that are less fortunate and those people that, have, that do not have access to the information and the resources that we currently have. Therefore, Moses Kotane, um, commissioned this research looking at KZN skills in demand and also further looking at skills that are critical at this day and age when it comes to um, understanding what the coronavirus has had on our operations and has had on various sectors, be it agriculture, be it manufacturing, be it uh, mining, tourism. We know that all these sectors have been negatively impacted by the coronavirus or the shutdown period. This has had to be implemented due to the increasing numbers of uh, people that have tested positive for the virus. I'm hoping that our speakers today will touch on all of those aspects so that we all leave understanding what really are the skills that we need to focus on, as this is especially true for um, uh, young people that are just going to start university. They need to understand what they need to focus on. They need to understand which sector they need to actually maybe study, because you'll find that that is a particular sector that is in demand and that is a particular sector where they will find employment. Without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to introduce our speakers uh, this afternoon. Our first speaker will be Dr. Twalo. Dr. Twalo is the Manager for Research and Skills Development at Moses Kotani. So he will be embarking or he'll be sharing with us the outcome of the study looking at KZN Skills and Demand Business Reports 2020-2021. Thank you very much. Over to you, Dr. Twalo. Hello. All right. Thank you, Dr. Butelezi. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. The report I'll be making is based on the study we undertook as the Moses Kodani Institute. The study sought to look at the skills in demand in KZN businesses, and we looked across all sectors of uh, the economy and uh, both uh, categories, formal and informal uh, sectors. The objective of uh, the study was to depict a picture of the skills that are in demand in the KZN labor market. And the, the intention for that was to ensure that uh, the decision makers uh, are able to make their decisions based on uh, research-based evidence. So your decision makers, policy makers and investors would be able to craft their plans with respect to 
the skills that are required by the businesses in um, in case and in light of uh, the study that we undertook. We did the study throughout uh, KZN and uh, in here are the districts uh, that we covered, which shows that uh, we covered the whole of uh, the province and the district that had the highest number of respondents was Ilembe District Municipality and uh, the one that had the lowest uh, number of respondents was Amachuba District Municipality. We had uh, data collectors who assisted us uh, doing um, the, the, the data collection uh, for Moses Kotane Institute who went to all these uh, places collecting the data. And uh, this is uh, an outcome of the work that they undertook. So this shows that uh, we did uh, collect data from both formal and informal businesses and from the formal businesses, we had uh, 1,410, um, sorry, for formal businesses, we had 906 respondents and informal uh, ones, we had 1,496 uh, respondents. So this is uh, the depiction of uh, the respondents in the informal sector. As you can see, the whole sale and retail sector had the highest number of respondents at 42.9%, uh, followed by services, which is 22.8% uh, uh, of respondents. Uh, a similar picture again appears in the formal sector, wherein wholesale and retail had 41% uh, respondents and services had 24.6%. So, uh, if we look at uh, the critical skills that are needed for the various businesses in the sector, starting with the agricultural sector, uh, we note that uh, the skills that are in high demand in this sector are technical skills and uh, technical skills refers to the skills that are required in that particular in that particular sector and uh, in this regard the agriculture forestry and fisheries sector requires more technical skills as depicted by the 59 percent of uh, the respondents and this is followed by uh, management skills as well as communication skills you will note that uh, throughout uh, the sectors, communication is one of the key consistent skill that is, uh, is required. With respect to mining and quarry, it's uh, almost at, uh, at a 50-50 level as depicted here because of the number of respondents who indicated that uh, they require uh, analytical skills and driving skills and those are shared equally at 50 percent. Uh, with regard to manufacturing, 61 percent of the respondents noted that uh, these skills, technical skills, are in high demand in this uh, sector. Like I indicated, with respect to communication, again, communication features prominently here with 18 percent of the respondents noting that this skill is um, required. Again, uh, one other skill that is um, critical is uh, the com customer care skill and this uh, on a larger scale falls into the category of the soft skills because when we talk uh, customer care is basically your skills about taking care of your customers, your empathy, your sympathy, your understanding of the customer needs and all the customer related um, uh, uh, skills. With respect to utilities, technical skills are again featured prominently, followed by communication at eight, with 18% of the respondents indicating so, and 12% uh, of the respondents uh, indicating that customer service is um, one of the skills that are required. Uh, in the construction sector, the respondents, 58.8% of them, noted that technical skills are needed uh, greatly in this, uh, in this sector, and these are followed by um, uh, the, the, your, your driving skills, 
and uh, communication skills again uh, are also required. And uh, with drivers, you know that uh, we've got 8.4% uh, 8 4, 8 4 uh, that are requiring, uh, that indicated that there's a need for this. And we, this is understandable given the nature of the sector that it requires your for, uh, forklift drivers, your truck drivers, and other um, machine operators, big machine operators, who will be able to operate the machines and drive the, 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 the machinery that is applicable in this sector. With respect to transport, particularly land transport, uh, driving was uh, indicated as a key skill that is uh, required as in 69% of the respondents indicated so. Uh, this is followed at 18% uh, of the respondents by communication as uh, the respondents indicated so. Again, uh, customer care appears is in this sector as well. In the finance, real estate and business uh, services sector, the skill that featured prominently is uh, financial advisory skill at 26% uh, and communication featured again prominently at 22%. Uh, it is also important that we note that 18% uh, of the respondents noted that computer skills are a critical skill in this uh, sector because like Dr. Tabtelezi indicated, given the shift into the fourth industrial revolution, digital skills are required at an increasing pace. So this 18% uh, of the respondents are actually affirming uh, the need for, for, for people to be capacitated in this regard. In the services sector, we note that uh, technical skills are noted as uh, those that are in high demand with 41% of the respondents indicating so. And uh, communication again features prominently with 28% of the respondents indicating the need, uh, the high demand for communication skills. In the wholesale and retail sector, we note that 36.8 respondents indicated that industry knowledge is key and this is followed by uh, communication skills as 20.6 percent of the respondents noted that uh, these skills are in uh, in high demand in the tourism and hospitality sector uh, the cooking and beverages uh, skills are indicated as skills that are in high demand as indicated by 58% of uh, the respondents. Uh, again, skills like customer care feature uh, prominently as 16% uh, of the respondents noted. So again, it's interesting to note that industry knowledge is also one of the skills that is uh, noted by the respondents as a skill that is required in this uh, sector. With respect to ICT, your information technology and communication, uh, the skill that uh, featured prominently is uh, technical skills. You, the people who are able to, 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 to operate the ICT machinery. These are the skills that are required prominently. And uh, with anything that is working, you also need the people in the background doing the repairs and maintenance of the machinery and those were noted at 26% or by 26% of the respondents uh, who said that uh, there's a need uh, for these skills. They noted that these skills are in high demand. Again, communication, like I indicated, it is one of the constant skills that are required across uh, all the sectors. So here it is featuring at 23% of um, uh, the respondents. So in a nutshell, the skills uh, in KZN that were indicated to be in demand uh, would be your technical skills, and those are sector specific, and uh, communication skills, and these are transversal across all sectors. Customer services are the soft skills that are required for taking care 
of uh, the customers and ensuring that uh, you can be able to get your customers coming back as a result of the kind of service they received. Computer skills were noted as skills that are in high demand, particularly because of the shift into the digital era, which is made uh, even more uh, urgent by the uh, shift as a result of the coronavirus and the shift into working from home by other people who are able to do so. Uh, driving was noted uh, in uh, particularly the construction sector, but this is a skill that is key uh, that uh, was noted as being in uh, high demand uh, in, in, uh, in the number of sectors. So as sales and marketing, numeracy and financial skills, time management, general management and administration. So this therefore that means that uh, academic institutions uh, need to provide uh, skills that are in high demand as noted here uh, because the, the, the observation by the participants is that uh, the current crop of graduates are lacking skills uh, that are required in the labor market, particularly soft skills such as your customer service, communication and other soft skills that are related to that. So uh, this renders uh, the graduates being unable to work effectively as a result of their inability to communicate effectively in, within their given spaces. And there's uh, also a, a, a view that graduates have high expectations of remuneration and that uh, employers often participate in programs with incentives for learnership and work readiness. However, they lack the time to guide and mentor uh, the, the, the graduates throughout the program and employers have high demands of work and good quality from graduates and uh, the other issue is the curriculum which is key because uh, curriculum includes among other things your communication and uh, other things that are related to soft skills in addition to the technical skills that a person would be doing. So we on the basis of this we recommend that uh, there's a need to, to, to look into the curriculum by higher education institutions to ensure that it um, responds to the demands, skills demands in the labor market. And there's also a greater need to work on uh, computer and digital skills as the need for this is, uh, uh, is increasing. There's also a, 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 a view that we need to invest in driving as this uh, was noted as one of the skills that are in demand in the in the, in the in the province and this has to be taken into consideration by both the local parties local uh, stakeholders and uh, broadly and uh, with respect to the question of skills we note that uh, these are skills that can be applied to any, any way in meaning in any other province. Hence, as a province, we need to work hard and ensure that we are able to retain the skills that we have as a province, meaning that the employment space has to be conducive for people to apply the skills that they have. And we're also taking into consideration the concerns of the graduates with respect to remuneration and uh, the, the, the areas in which uh, the or the environment in which uh, they work, which include, among other things, the application of skills such as communication and uh, customer, customer care. With those uh, <clears throat> words, I would like to thank you. Thanks. Thank you so much, Dr. Charles, for that insightful presentation. We really appreciate it. And also what I noted from the presentation that Dr. Tola has presented is the importance of communication. I mean, Dr. Tola has elaborated and said that communication, customer care are one of the drivers that are, or one of the skills that are essential at this day and age, followed by IT, of course, as I indicated from the start of um, the, lectures, the, the, the lecture seminar. What is also I would like to maybe point out from the presentation is the importance of communication. 
So you communicate with your customers, of course. You need to understand your customer needs. You need to understand what your customer demands. And also you need to understand what is it that you can do differently in your business. That also is what Dr. Solo has touched on in terms of what makes your business different. We know that in a business you need to employ different strategies to make you uh, maybe like a person who is maybe in that in that particular leader in that particular sector. So you need to employ the strategies, be it low cost, be it differentiation strategy, be it a product focused strategy, because all of these strategies will assist um, a business in order for them to strive and achieve what is called a competitive advantage. So those are the things that we need to start focusing on, not only for the young people that are still going to universities. However, those are the skills. What Dr. Sala has pointed out are the skills that we, even as adults, can fine tune so that we can better represent ourselves, we can better represent the businesses that we are in, and also we can strive in the industry that we are in. And also he emphasized the importance of technical skills. So you need to balance your technical skills with what we call soft skills so that when you are selling your products or your organization is actually promoting a particular product, you know exactly what the organization is doing, you know exactly what your product is all about, and you know exactly the target market and so forth. That is why I, this, this information sharing is so important and critical for general public in South Africa. Everybody needs to understand what are the skills that we need to focus on? This is also backed up by literature. If you go to literature, you'll see that there's a lot of focus in terms of soft skills. There's a lot of focus in terms of IT. There's a lot of focus in engineering as well. So these are the areas that we need to focus on and make sure that we encourage young people to maybe do uh, or, or pursue careers that are in these particular sectors. With that, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to hand over to our second guest speaker, Miss <coughs> Miss Bongiwe Mwango, who is a research manager in the Education and Skills Development Research Program in the Human Sciences Research Council. Uh, Miss Mwango has vast interest when it comes to inequality, labor markets, and also is currently persuading her. Pers pursuing a PhD in industrial psychology at the University of Pretoria. Ms. Mwango, thank you very much for taking the time to be with us today. Uh, we are looking forward to the information that you'll be sharing with us, and we know that we'll learn a lot, not only as an institution, but everyone that is currently uh, listening today will learn a lot from the presentation. So Ms. Mwango will be, presentation, will be presenting on skill supply, demand and mismatches in South Africa labor market. Over to you, Ms. Mwango. Thank you very much. Ms. Mwango? Please bear with us, ladies and gentlemen, as we are still trying to connect Ms. Mwango. Over to you, Ms. Mwango. Good day, colleagues. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can clearly hear you now. Great, great. So thank you, Chair, uh, and good day, everybody. Firstly, I would like to extend our gratitude to the Moses Godane Institute um, for having invited the HSRC team to this meeting. Uh, as researchers, we are always appreciative of any opportunity to speak about our work. So your invite prompted us um, to take stock 
of the work that we've done in the past to see what data or what intelligence uh, out there could be useful or insightful uh, as a way of supporting you as you are thinking about uh, skills development uh, in the province. So I thought of three studies um, that fall under the banner of the Labour Market Intelligent Partnership Project that we completed a few years ago. And I also thought of TEAMS, which is a trend in international mathematics and science study, which is also um, rolled out by the HSRC. And I thought it would be a useful start, even though in most instances we're not able to disaggregate to the provincial level, but hopefully um, this is the first of the many other engagements to come. Whilst the LMIP focused on labour market and skill issues, teams focuses on educational outcomes. Then the last study observed public attitudes to work. Uh, I won't have time to get onto the last study, but basically it was just uh, our first initiative to focus on trying to understand the labour market perceptions and values um, of South Africans. Just as a background, because all these efforts should ultimately feed into our skills planning processes. So I thought, let's just let me just take you a bit back to where the labour market intelligent partnership came from. We have had um, talk talks about South Africa having shortages of skills in some specific sectors, um, employers. Um, talking about lack of talent among the graduates, students not having necessary skills as demanded by the labor market and so forth. So since 1994, there's been a number of efforts where as a country we've tried to plan for skills needs, but these efforts have to a large extent been fragmented and our skills system have been very imperfect as evidenced by the, by the skills shortages that we continue to see. So there was therefore a more coordinated, more coherent and a more um, a need for a more responsive planning system. So in 2009, the South African government prioritized skills planning through government priority outcome 5.1. Um, Some of you might be uh, familiar with these priority outcomes, um, which whose main objective was to establish a credible institutional mechanism for skills planning. So to meet this objective in 2012, the Department of Higher Education and Training, um, DHED, initiated a collaboration with the HSRC, uh, the Human Sciences uh, Research Council, and um, that's when the Labour Market Intelligent Partnership Project came about. So the LMIP has rolled out a number of research studies producing a number of reports that you can find online. But one of these reports was the skill supply and demand report, which I'm speaking uh, to you about today, which basically presents a, a holistic understanding of the current supply and demand of skills in South Africa. And I must say it represented one of the very first attempts to analyze how the two interact, the two meaning skills demanded skill supply, uh, which is critical to inform the future skills uh, policy to support uh, inclusive growth. So remember, the key objective was to come up with a credible institutional mechanism for skills planning. So what I have here um, in this slide is, is the framework which represents the key output of the Labour Market Intelligent Partnership Project. So the HSRC-led consortium developed this national more nuanced model for skills planning. Basically, this framework um, begins to set out demands for, uh, demand for skills uh, from both business and government, uh, looking at government growth initiatives as well, looking at um, the trajectory of our economy, attempting to describe the demographic of the employed as well as the unemployed in our society. And we went on to analyze the supply of skills from the education and training institution, and then actually track the sectors and occupation where these skills were, were utilized. Just one important thing I want to say is uh, this framework provides insight into national and sectoral trends. Um, and thereby outlines areas of education and training needs and policy um, implications. But I just want to break it down further. Just saying the starting point should always be 
understanding the economy. You see there uh, on the uh, uh, on the top. You have to look at which sectors are growing. You have to look at which sectors are, are shrinking. Who is in the labor force? What school? What skills do they hold? Then, according to the framework, we have to move on to look at the supply side, where you take stock of the current skill supply, looking at the actual composition of the labor force. For instance, look at the demographic trends, look at the migration trends, and so forth. Then you move on on my right. Then you have to oh, oh, as on the left as well, where you look at the demand side just to get a sense of skills that is required by the economy. And here you begin to look at the employment patterns, vacancies and engage with employers regarding skills strategies. However, this is the point that I wanted to make. Um, such a framework has been designed for the use at a national level. Uh, skills planning at the regional and provincial level is still, however, missing in, in South Africa. We've started working through trying to adapt to this national framework to develop a, a provincial skills supply and demand models, which will be cognizant of the local challenges and opportunities um, because through because this would assist the province in identifying its skills needs, drawing from the particularities of the growth objectives and current supply realities. And such intelligence will clearly enhance our understanding of the skills um, challenges um, and opportunities in the province, as well as provide um, good, um, provide current and future signals for, sust for sustainable um, employment. Okay, so moving on now, so we're starting to go um, through the framework. So here I'm just going to give you a flavor of the key uh, findings based on our 2014 report, which has subsequently been revised by our colleagues in Cape Town with the latest figures. So in terms of the current realities, um, just really just um, moving fast on this one, um, this slide just provides key confirmation of what is already known about our economy. Firstly, challenges um, related to high levels of unemployment, particularly amongst um, the youth. Um, the South African economy alongside other global economy as well if that's stagnated and we are not experiencing significant growth um, and this has resulted in a decline in agriculture and we're seeing very limited growth in many jobs uh, of the element elementary sectors. So putting the issues of skills and employability aside, our economy has not been able to absorb large numbers of the youth coming into the labor into the labor force. And um, there's been a structural shift toward the service economy, and uh, we're seeing much more dependence on on, on high skilled financial services, uh, including retail trade, as you will see in the in, in the next slide. OK, so this is basically a visualization of the text that we had in the previous slide, um, indicative of high levels of unemployment the labor force growing at almost twice um, the rate of jobs being created. We're seeing more youngsters coming to the labor market. But um, the interesting story is, is in that graph, which shows that which shows the labor market uh, participation status by level of education. You will see that uh, of the 15 million people employed, 15 million people. So in that graph that says skills levels and labor force participation, you will see we've got the employed and the unemployed. That's where I am. So you'll see that of the 15 million people employed, 3 million had tertiary education, whilst five uh, had a metric uh, or equivalent, and 2 million had a primary education. But the most informa informative story, I think, is around the issue uh, of unemployment, where those with tertiary education are clearly much less likely to be um, in unemployment. OK, so this slide basically begins to show the interaction between the sectoral contribution to GDP and employment growth. And you'll see that the main contributor to GDP is the financial and business services at 22%. But then look at how much. Um, do I need to click again to show? OK, there we go. There we go. Click again. OK, 
but then look at how much um, is contribution is contributing to employment a mere 15 percent this again points that to the fact that we need more labor intensive sectors including agriculture and manufacturers to grow which would enable us to absorb large numbers of unemployed people alongside this uh, already growing high skill services and industries uh, we know that the contribution to GDP of the manufacturing industry is continuing, is continuing to decline um, across time on one hand, whilst on the other hand, the financial services, the transport sector, the community and social and personal services are growing. Uh, so I'm going to structure my few minutes that I left. Um, OK, so just going forward, I've tried to structure my talks according to the three stories. The first basic story, looking at looking uh, at the health of our education system by drawing on the results from teams. And what I'm basically saying there is that it starts at the basic school level. That's where we should be focusing on. Um, where it is important to develop mathematics and science knowledge and skills, which are critical and are required uh, for the labor market um, and economic growth. So the key argument is that education and skills are central to achieving eco economic transformation and inclusive um, economic growth than we, that we want. And a number of studies do demonstrate a strong relationship between education and labor market out outcomes. Furthermore, as we're moving towards the knowledge economy, I think Tim Gose also touched on that it places different uh, demands on the labor force. We require more specialized skills and there's much more emphasis on the need for lifelong learning, regardless of where you are employed, what you are doing, regardless of employment type, because labor markets are, are always in a flux, requiring new skills every day. Okay. So just roughly again, just uh, I also just pulled from teams um, some of the figures which I thought might be of interest. So this figure shows. Um, OK, so this figure shows that mass achievement at the national level. It shows that. Um, so these are the, the team's results. Um, so teams was conducted. I think we had a report in 2013 and we also rolled it out in 2015 and it's also um, conducted in the number 40 or so countries um, around the world. So what we're seeing there is that between 2003 and 2015 uh, in maths in relation to other countries uh, participating in teams and teams measure strengths and it's, it's the only realistic uh, measure in South Africa that can tell us uh, how We've changed over time. So this is a very interesting uh, slide, colleagues, because it has both good and bad news. So compared to other countries, South Africa is the only country that experienced the most improvement in math and science. But yeah, although we are still one of the lowest performance countries, which makes sense because we started at a very low base. We still have a long way to go. I won't go much onto the numbers, but uh, the good story to take is that we are improving, even though um, there needs to be, we need to increase the pace of change. I thought this will also be of interest. I, request, I requested it from the teams, um, from, 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 the, from, from our colleagues uh, who are involved in teams, just to look at the performance across uh, the different provinces. Uh, you can see that um, Gauteng and Western Cape are the best performing prov provinces, exceeding the national score, which was of 372, with all other provinces registering below the national score. But um, you can see that it's like there are, there are three main uh, bands. The first one is Gauteng and Western Cape. Then KZN is with Mpumalanga, Free State and Northern Cape. Then lastly, we see Northwest and Eastern Cape. This is also just looking at how the children are performing at, 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 at the schooling level before we even start talking about what's happening in the higher level, at the higher levels. 
I also thought this would be interesting and it adds an additional layer of information by looking at the influence of contextual factors on mass achievement. For instance, you can we found that home social class as measured through uh, SES, uh, which takes into account access to amenities such as electricity. So we're looking at to what extent all those things have uh, impact children performance. So we're seeing a strong correlation between family, social standing and performance. Um, parents that have resources um, do help their children out. Uh, Oh, another interesting one we also picked up on the importance of language where your language is the same as the language of learning and teaching. Kids tend to understand concept easily and, the, and thus perform um, better. And again, I think age came out. Um, a story to share there is that learners who are age appropriate tend to perform better compared to those who are repeating. OK. OK, then moving from the foundation, we've seen how our, how our kids are performing at the basic school levels. Now we're moving to the trends in higher education and training. And basically the, the trends to a certain extent are reflective of the continuities of the schooling phase. So what is coming out clearly is, is, is that the key constraint um, for how our that system and the labor markets are doing is can be attributed to the inadequate quality of basic um, education. So for instance, in, in this slide, um, we've got um, numbers of kids who wrote, who, who said for metric. Um, so we were just looking at how many achieved a bachelor's pass across years and how many um, achieved um, over 50% in maths, meaning they could pursue a career um, in STEM. OK. So what this slide is showing that um, on average, about 150,000 grade 12 students um, complete the matriculation, uh, matriculation examination with a bachelor's pass. However, only about 50,000 of our students in South Africa pass metric with a score higher than 50%. Already, our, you can see that it's, the pool is getting smaller and smaller of who will be able to take any STEM related um, qualification. OK. OK. This one again is very informative because it's looking at the completers from university, more specifically from TVET College. OK, so what it's showing is that um, completers from university, uh, more especially TVET colleges, um, are a concern. So for instance, let's just look at the universities. Um, only 27% completes in the business, economic and management sciences. Only 30% science engineering technology completes compared to the 43% of the humanities. Again, that's also just show you the kind of people that we'll have in the labor force at some point. OK, so this is another very informative slide by one of our colleagues, um, Serfaz, which is useful in trying to map out the trends and completion rates. So. Very simplified, what this slide is showing that when we're starting off at the base of 100%, 94% go to grade 9, then only 60% sits for metric, only 37% actually pass, 14 of those gets a bachelor's degree, um, and 12 gets a diploma. I guess the rest get certificates or just a pass. Only 12% makes it. Um, to university, nine immediately go there, and the three percent uh, is delayed, but eventually also goes to some to, to to a university. Sixty percent completes and get certificates, and four percent completed degree. So we have a very small pool of skilled and capable individuals. Of course, this is only looking at the university trend, but it does give a general picture. Uh, a general idea of how we're doing in terms of the success rates. Uh, 
And then moving quickly on this one, we've moved from the foundation, which is basic schooling to trends in higher education and training. Now we're looking at the labor markets. Here I've only just got two, two slides. Um, and I just, one thing I just want to say there is that, OK, so we looked at where the graduates go. Half of the graduates are employed you'll see are employed in the community and social and personal services. That is largely a, a public sector. So, yeah. And the question is, is that where we really need, is that where we really need them for our economy to grow? If they are all concentrated in the community and social services and the financial sectors. And then we try to look specifically at um, the set graduates to see where are they distributed ac ac across the different industries. And again, you'll see you see that uh, most of them are in the financial sector, whilst you would expect them to be maybe in construction, to be in mining, but uh, most of our STEM graduates tend to be concentrated in the financial sector. On, on one hand, it does illustrate that engineering is a very, you know, kind of versatile skills and um, engineers might work in the different sectors. Um, but again, it's just a concern when many of our STEM graduates are concentrated in one specific sector. OK, I know I've loaded you with a lot of information, but in just trying to wrap it up um, and looking at the possible Im implications um, that came out from the study, we definitely need to improve education and skills of our people. We need to increase, focus on increasing proportion of our STEM graduates um, to look um, at the pipelines. Um, without going into detail with many with, with, with the other implication. Um, I just wanted to share this with you. The contrast between the data available on the supply side and on the labor market and demand side is striking. No national probability samples exist for industrialized countries at the establishment level. So there is a short supply of data from the demand side as this data is an important component of the labor market intelligence. Hence, I'm also excited about the study that um, the organization has con conducted. I know the information I've given you is um, to a certain extent um, at a very high level, at a provincial level, but I hope that uh, some of the trends um, will be useful as you're working towards finalizing your report. Thank you. Hello. Thank you so much, Ms. Nwango. We appreciate the presentation so much. And it has been very informative, not only for me as a chairperson, but it has been informative for, I'm sure, for the general public. And from the results that you presented, Ms. Nwango, I, I just have a couple of questions with regards to the number of people that are actually, uh, the number of STEM graduates that are focusing on agriculture. I've noticed that on the slides that you presented, there's like just maybe one percent that are focusing on agriculture. And also when you look at mining, you don't have a lot of graduates that are focusing on the sector. What could be the reason if you know why this is this is the, the case? Hello. Am I still? Mama, did you get the question? Can you still yes. hear me? Yes, I can still hear you. Okay, I, you I, I got you towards the end. I got you towards the end. Can you just repeat it for me, please? Thank you, Ms. Nwango. You've indicated in your presentation that the, the limited number of the STEM graduates that we have, most of them, we focus on uh, financial sector, so to speak. However, I also noticed that you have even less uh, graduates that are focusing in agriculture. So my question is, do, do you have a reason as to why that is the case, Ms. Nwango? Oh, yeah, no, that's an interesting question. I think the slide you, you, you're referring to, um, I was talking about where they go. 
so obviously they look at the sectors that is likely to offer them you know more benefits and maybe that's how they end up in the financial sector and um, they drop out of the other sectors where we'll expect them to go but again i think a lot uh, could be done in order to attract um, the learners um, into other sectors such as um, agriculture in terms of uh, shaping their aspirations because i know that some still um, look at other occupations uh, you know as uh, Dirty jobs or, you know, of the past or something like that. So I think there, we, there is a lot that we can do, even as communities, uh, different uh, uh, players um, can contribute uh, in different ways, you know, in terms of just um, encouraging them to also um, participate in this sector such as agriculture. Thank you so much, Ms. Mwango. I really appreciate it. But also what I noticed is that the number of matriculants, this is not addressed only to you, Ms. Mwango, this is also addressed to Dr. Twalo. The number of um, matriculants that are finishing high school with like 50% pass rate has dropped significantly through the years. And uh, do, do we have maybe an explanation as to why that is the case? Or maybe could the introduction of math literacy uh, influence the number of uh, the numbers as we can see from 2011 to 2014? It's a big, it's a big jump uh, as compared to uh, what has happened in the previous years. Semkosi, do you want to take it first? Yes, no, you can. Okay, I, I think that the actual numbers of kids that also just sit to write um, exams in maths and other STEM um, related subjects are also declining. It seems as if our kids are also <laughs> starting to fear. <laughs> Uh, to, to, to fear these subjects. Um, mm. But maybe just to add to that, um, the other thing which came out of our study is the issue of uh, communication as a, as a critical skill. And with communication, even at a high school level, is something critical because if we talk, for instance, academic writing, that is something that... Um, that is something that the students engage with uh, with their with their teachers in terms of communicating their understanding of the concepts. So if their level of understanding the academic concepts is compromised, it therefore means that it will also translate to the throughput rate at, uh, at the high school level as well. So it therefore means that when we talk communication, it's not just uh, the, the, the verbal that matters, but uh, what you put in writing, how you put in writing, how you make an argument, and uh, such uh, nuances with respect to the field of uh, communication. Thank you yes. so much. Yeah, yeah, just to come back there. So basically, uh, it's, it's, it's a combination of a number of factors because I'm thinking even the schooling, even the school conditions, um, will affect um, the performance of the of the children, um, the teachers, um, even the, par the, 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 the parents, you know, the parent, how to what extent do they engage with the kids, to what extent are the parents present. So what I'm trying to say is that it, it, it could be a number of factors um, that will manifest, that we'll see through the outcomes in our education system. Thank you so much. Um, but from what I gathered, Ms. Mwango, is that there is still a need for, for us as a whole in South Africa to focus on primary school learning. Because I just I saw from the presentation that there's a lot of the problems, they emanate from primary school and then they only manifest at high school and at higher uh, institutions of learning. Yet if the problem was solved when the students were doing their grade one for instance or if they are doing preschool we need to start 
changing or making the difference there and making mathematics and science attractive, not only to the students that maybe go to a model C schools, but to the students that are in rural areas, because we know that there is potential for our students to do better in mathematics. It's just that we need to apply our minds <clears throat> in terms of how we can improve the existing or the current status in our education system, because there's, there's really, it is a worrying study. It's worrying statistics that we are learning about today. And if we don't do anything about it, we'll end up not having anyone in the agriculture sector. We'll end up not having uh, doctors who are from uh, KZN, for, so to speak, or in South Africa, because those are the critical subjects that we need to be promoting from grassroots. And uh, also that by the time a student is doing matric, they know exactly what they want to do and they know exactly the skills that are required for them to actually master the, the subject of mathematics and science. I don't know if I can get your comments on that. I'm just saying that perceptions about um, different sectors are also critical. And I'm seeing a major role um, of we need some more career guidance uh, for our kids, especially as they stream and start to be picking subjects. Because um, in, in, in most of the studies that I've been involved in, one of the consistent findings is that most kids, especially in rural areas, uh, are not exposed. They are not aware of interesting opportunities, for instance, in the agricultural sector. So, yeah. So I think we need, um, especially at the provincial level, at the local level, we need to do much in terms of career guidance and just exposing um, the kids to the to the interesting parts as well um, of the different uh, of being involved or working in the different sectors. Uh, thank you, Ms. Mwango. Just just to maybe emphasize on that, that's that's a very critical point that you've raised in terms of educating our, our children to know what are the careers that are out there. Like if you are from a rural school, so to speak, you end up being disadvantaged and you end up ending uh, doing uh, courses in humanities, for instance, yet your interest or what resonates with you are the sciences, yet you are not getting that opportunity because you lack the necessary knowledge in terms of what you can study moving forward. I have one last question. Uh, uh, speakers from um, Ayandi Swam Sane. <clears throat> I'm trying to go about being a skills development facilitator or a social facilitator to enhance my skills and training within different organizations. Can you please assist with pointing out in terms of wh what I can do and what I need to do to actually grow those skills in terms of being a skills development facilitator? Uh, mm -hmm. All right. I think uh, if I were to go first, uh, it depends on the because facilitation cuts across all uh, all sectors. It could be facilitation in the education sector, working mostly with uh, the sector education uh, training authorities. It could be facilitation in other sectors as well, like your construction as well includes um, a facilitation skills. So it goes back to some of the skills that I pointed out in my presentation, wherein technical skills uh, were prominent as the skills that are required. And by technical skills, it's the skills that are required in that particular sector. So um, it therefore means that uh, Ayandiswa needs to make some investigation as to what are the, the available opportunities in the sector that she is interested in and also look at the institutions that are offering such, um, such skills. Thank you, Dr. Tualo. I have another question um, from Sabeli Siwe Ngobo. She's asking, in light of the glaring challenges in our education, education sector, as revealed under the COVID-19 period, this feud is with highly exorbitant prices of accessing education in South Africa. How relevant are the academic institution as a source of these skills that we've discussed today as compared to online avenues or online learning? 
So some of the CUAs basically indicating that when you when you want to go to university, you have to pay exorbitant amount of money for you to be able to acquire the particular degree that you want to embark on. So she's asking whether is it still relevant for them to go to academic institutions such as the institutions of higher learning or should they just focus on online um, uh, courses that are provided for free by other institutions? So what is your take on that? It's a bit of a, okay, from my side, it's a bit of a broad question. Um, I, I wish we knew what is Sanel Siwe's um, interest because it really depends on what qualification the person wants to pursue. If you want um, a degree, obviously you'll have to go to the university um, and you, you can go to TVET if you want a, a, a diploma or a, you want to do a skills program. Um, so I think it basically depends on what she wants to do and whether she wants a degree or yeah. But just to add to that, uh, some uh, programs require more practice, which would then mean the need for uh, attending a, physic, a physical university. And uh, other programs would be would do well with online learning and pe many people have done well with distance learning, for instance, through UNISA and other institutions that are offering distance learning. And with the introduction of uh, the new ways of learning as a result of the COVID-19, it therefore means that there will be an increase in terms of uh, the number of people who are enrolling for online courses rather than going to universities to stay there and study full time. You, you are muted, Dr. Chiles, we can't hear you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. T. I have one last question uh, that is asking, with COVID-19 and changes in the world of work that is linked to 4IR, what are the skills that will be in demand going forward? And what will the tertiary or educational institution, will they be able to meet these demands. So the person is asking with COVID-19 and the shift to the fourth industrial revolution, what are the skills that are critical now? And will those, this, those skills be, will the institutions of higher learning be able to meet those uh, skills that are demanded? Or will they be offering uh, courses that are relevant to the skills that are demanded by the fourth industrial revolution in also looking at COVID-19? Okay, a quick answer there because I see that we are running out of time is that uh, there's an, uh, as I noted that one, there's a need for universities to, to revise their curriculum in order to fit the demands of uh, the current skills and future skills as well. Be that as it may, we note that uh, there's an increase in the demand for digital skills. And uh, I know uh, that some universities have started engaging in that in terms of enrolling for students for programs that would respond to such, uh, to such a need. However, the demand is still there. It therefore means that uh, more and more players in the uh, higher education and training uh, sector need to ensure that this demand is being met. Thank you so much, Dr. Twalo. I don't know if Ms. Um, uh, do you have any closing remarks before I just uh, uh, conclude our session? No, no colleagues, thank you so much. Thank you so much for an invite. I'd like to thank our speakers today and also I'd like to thank um, all the people that have taken the time to actually take part in this uh, session and also for those people that have submitted their questions. It's only through questions where we can really understand what people want us to focus on. So we appreciate all the questions that have come through. And in closing, I'd like to close with a quote by Robert Greene, 
where he says the future belongs to those who learn more skills and combine those skills in a creative way. With that, ladies and gentlemen, I thank you very much. Uh, I thank you all for your participation and, all, and taking the time to just be with us today. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.